Hey, listeners, Dan Harris here, host of the 10% Happier Podcast. Imagine all your audio entertainment available in just one place. That's what the Audible app is all about. With Audible, you can always find the best of what you love or discover something new. Audible has an incredible selection of wellness titles and originals like The Light Podcast by Michelle Obama, Work It Out by Mel Robbins, and Confidence Gap by Russ Harris. Membership includes access to Audible Originals, podcasts, and tons of audiobooks that you can download or stream as much as you want. And as an Audible member, you can choose one title per month from an ever-growing catalog of titles to keep. The Audible app makes it easy to listen anytime, anywhere, whether you're traveling, working out, doing chores, wherever your day takes you. New members can try Audible now free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash Harris or text Harris to 500-500. The weather is cooling down a bit. The leaves are starting to fall. Yes, it's that time of year again. Football season. And we all know the best part of any game day traditions are the ones that involve food. There's nothing like having everyone in your game day crew coming together to bring their best bites and argue over whose family makes the best chili. And while there's no need to mess with the perfection of game day classics, like a freshly grilled Oscar Mayer hot dog topped with Heinz ketchup and mustard, it's always fun to step out of your comfort zone and get creative with your recipes. Because there's nothing more fun than adding to your list of game day traditions, like making a creamy and delectable queso dip with Velveeta cheese that can be eaten with so much more than just chips. Now is the chance for people across the nation to find out whose game day eats reign supreme. It's your turn to show off your tasty game day food traditions. Go to www.gamedayfoodtraditions.com to share a photo of your game day food tradition to enter to win $10,000. Once again, that's www.gamedayfoodtraditions.com to enter to win $10,000. This is Full Change with Tom Laidlaw. Stop with that. So I've got really good accents now and everything too, like Mm -hmm. Irish and... No, you have not. We body lie. Anyway, so Tom, today we have probably the biggest show we've done. We have Ranger Legends on the show. We have three, well, two incredible historic Ranger defensemen and yourself. We have James Patrick. Dave Maloney and Tom. I think all you guys are top 100 ranges of all time, right? Yes. Did you make that cut, Tom? Yes, 87th. Yeah, where were you, Dave? 30. You no, know, we'll fly by one. So I think yeah, sure. Be one. James, what were you? Seven, eight? I have no idea. Um, oh, you, why did I yeah. kill you? I have no idea. Then I let doesn't It doesn't matter. <laughs> well, it's a nice honor, honor but I don't, yeah. I don't have a clue. Chief, I think you were like three. Yeah. Yeah. No, exactly. I wasn't. I know I was. Had a, had a Gretzky. If you were, you should have been like three. Uh, right behind Harry Owl and Brian Leach. Uh, I guess I've been no, working lately. I've been, I've been watching a lot of our old playoff series. Uh, James James got that crossover going like 100 miles an hour, right? I forgot about that. Good feet. Like I re- yeah. Honestly, I remember in Buffalo, I was hurt. Uh, I think I broke my thumb. That was really a wise thing, too. We're beating Vancouver 6-1 late in the third period, and Willie Brassov scores a goal. I'm on the ice. I was so pissed. I punched him and broke my thumb. <laughs> anyway, that oh. leads me to the story of standing in Buffalo. Set, uh, we were out after Herbie had skated the bejesus out of me. Right. And he's talking about this kid that's uh, you know from Western Canada, top pick, and boy, could he skate. He was just yeah. talking about how this guy could skate and what, how good he was going to be. Right. And that, that was, in hindsight, and even then, it was one of the few things I actually agreed with her. Well, how, you agreed with Herb a lot of the first when he, he fought, first got there. You guys were, yeah, oh yeah, I was like right up, right up against his rear end the whole first three years. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember when? Uh, so I'm gonna pick on Nikki Fatil a little bit. So Nikki had a bad game, and he he got in a couple days later. He got in early to practice before everybody else did, and I guess he told Herb the reason he had a bad game was that he'd been out drinking the night before, and that's why he's playing bad. And so when we walk, we all the rest of us walk in the locker room. Herb announces this in front of the whole team. And of course, for the next several days, it was like, a, Herb, you remember that game about two years ago where I played bad? So I, I was drinking that before. Yeah. And then he said, Oh, that was funny. And like Herb and Nikki, too. Herb was not like Nikki was not Herb's kind of guy, but Herb loved Nikki, right? Yeah. 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 Well, it wasn't Nikki's, wasn't Nikki's limit like two beers? Oh, yeah. yeah. He could drink it more than that. Yeah. We probably had what, three? Yeah. This, is, this is a Dave Maloney story, too. So, uh, 
Uh-oh. Remember when Nikki would go up by the red line and we'd pass in the puck, especially the garden, Herb would want him to go up forward, right, into the other team zone. But Nikki would always want to circle back, the big circle, and the crowd's going nuts in that square garden. Nikki's got the hair flying, you know, and he's going to take a wrist shot from red line. And uh, so I, Herb was saying, don't pass to Nikki, don't pass to Nikki. So Dave and I go out on the ice. I said, Dave, what are we going to do? He says, we're, we're passing to Nikki. <laughs> and it... Because Herb would just lose his mind too. It was just hilarious to watch because like, he's winding up like he's not paying attention to anything, right? He's just going. I tell you, I I roomed with him too. I mean, it was like I roomed with him and Jimmy Shonsa. Oh, wow. and both those guys had to kind of sleep with one eye open. Oh, was Jody that way too? Wow. Like, yeah. Were you okay? What is he doing? <laughs> what am I going to do? My you know hot sheet or whatever they used to do. And anyway, we digress. Cheap. Um, but what's the what's the hot sheet? What's what's the hot sheet? Explain that. Well, uh, the hot sheet was when he put the hot bomb down in the bottom of the uh, you know the sheets were wrapped so tight in the, uh, right, the hotel in the bed. You know, like oh, you know, you want to think of what it was. <laughs> and uh, can you recall? <laughs> so, um, but Herbie was right. Herbie talked about how well James could skate. He does skate and with puck. Yeah, and so I still think I still think he's my vote for number three. Well, no, no, please. Let's see. You know what he's number one in, though? He, he tied up his skates to most of any player that's ever played in the National Hockey League. Yeah. And you still remember that, eh, Tommy? Yeah, oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. You know, he tried. We, hey, maybe we both should have tried that when it ended up skating. Oh, yeah. No, no kidding. Yeah. I was I was fussy about, I really like my skates tight right around my ankle, but I, I hated taping my ankle because I, I think I wanted a little give. Yeah. I did, as my career went on, I got over... I learned how to tighten them in a certain way that I didn't need to tighten them. Then did, did one said, coach ye- didn't one coach yell at you one time about tying your skates up all the time? Is it? I don't know. I I can't remember. He's, hey, you you asked me if I remember. You know, me. I'm like a dog on a bone. I don't forget those things. It probably did happen. Uh, I know it frustrated my defense and coaches. So, James, uh, one thing I want to go over: uh, you had a fantastic year last year. The team got moved from Winnipeg to uh, Washington State, correct? Yes, it's sold. Yeah, good. And they they want to hire all U.S. born people to be on the team, right? Yes, right. So you're not coaching with that club anymore. I'm not coaching. Um, uh, to make the long story short, uh, my contract was up going into my last year. I wasn't sure if I was going to continue in junior. I loved it. I loved last few years of coaching were the best years, as good a years of uh, of hockey. Had a great group of kids. Um, I was wondering if uh, I wanted to continue along that lines, but um, so the team was in Winnipeg for five years. They were moved there with the um, with the uh, knowledge that they a new rink had to be built within three years. And uh, so Gresh's nephew is the owner of the team, was the owner, and um, you know he's a very successful businessman in Winnipeg. But um, I don't know whether it was COVID or, or other circumstances. But uh, when we went there, they had plans. They had the site. They were ready to, you know, break ground. And then it just never happened. Um, and I know the league was getting very upset with our, our franchise. We had a model franchise. We had, you know, a fantastic team. But we were playing out of a uh, the smallest and oldest rink in the, in the league. And um, so there was a lot of rumors going on. But... Um, you know, we lost in the finals, uh, real hard fought, um, you know, the league finals. And uh, and two days uh, after, in my meeting, I was told the team was coming back and, you know, I was just trying to decide whether I was going to continue coaching. Um, about a week later, I, I I said I'd like to come back for one more year. And, uh, and two days later, the team was sold. Um, but I was told the team was coming back for sure. Um, I think... Um, I think the league was just, from what I'm hearing, the the league, the Western Hockey League, was so um, frustrated, disappointed, upset with our franchise, no progress being made on the new building, um, and it, it is, uh, it's it's a good league. I mean, you look at the the rinks in college hockey in the U.S. and uh, some of the rinks in in our league, the, the newer rinks are fantastic. You know they're. You know, seven, eight thousand, nine thousand seat arenas. Uh, you know, Victoria, Kamloops, Kelowna, uh, Medicine Hat, um, Red Deer. They all have 
great junior ranks. Uh, Calgary and Edmonton play in the NHL ranks, so those are fantastic. And um, so, anyways, the, the the team was moved to Wenatchee, uh, uh, Washington. Um, and I, you know, again, I that by this time I I knew I wasn't didn't want to go with the team, but then uh, none of the staff, you know, our trainers, equipment managers, uh, front office, radio, none of them were brought with the team. They they wanted to hire an all American staff. Kevin Constantine was hired as head coach. He just got suspended. Um, oh, that's right. What happened? Five days ago for it's. Uh, um, it doesn't look good from what I'm told. Uh, um, so there's yeah, it's just uh, he and Mike Babcock have got the same agent, I guess. Yeah, it, they're um, it kind of it runs in a similar vein there with what happened, and uh, um, obviously you, you get very close. So I've had a lot of my. There's about 14 of the kids that I coached are are on that team, and uh, you know a number of them had been calling me. It, it's been a tough move for them. They, it's a beautiful area, but uh, um, it's it's the hockey part. Uh, the kind of the new situation has been tough, and now it, this new situation over the last five days is not it's not very fun for them right now. I forgot I read that. Yeah, that's right too. But James, the the good thing as far as you personally, uh, and I'll get you started on it, but a uh, bunch of people around the league reached out to you right away, a lot of general managers, and really expressed their interest in having you come there and how good of a coach they thought you were, correct? Right? Um, I did. I I mean, uh, is what happened within, uh, you know, two days of the team being sold, probably had maybe three offers and eventually had five offers to coach other teams. It just, it was one of those years where there were a lot of coaching uh, openings, but I found it so hard to, wrapping my head around coaching this group of kids and these team, this team. And then two days later saying, no, I'm going to coach another group and, and move. And I just, I wasn't ready to do that. So, um, decided best thing for me is to take the year off. Um, I ended up, uh, agreeing to become a consultant with, uh, the Victoria Royals, um, because our, our old uh, assistant GM has gone and become the GM there. And, um, uh, so right now I'm just, uh, I'm consulting and doing a bit of mentorship with a couple of young players on Victoria. That's excellent. So a story that started off, maybe not so good, ends up being a good story for you right now. You, you know what other people think you're on the league. Yeah. It, um, <clears throat> it's, uh, it, that is a great feeling. Um, I, I will say this and it wasn't just me. I had a great staff and with the GM, the assistant GM and myself were with this team for six years, but I, I know we built, um, we had the most wins over the last four years in the Western hockey league, the last two years, the most in Canada, but the culture and the program on development that we built was, was really good. And it was, uh, we had it in a real good place. So I was, that's what hurt about, you know, with the team moving, I just thought, geez, we had really built something, um, not only real good hockey players and real good team, but really good young men on how, how to behave, how, how to, res- you know, respect their teammates, how to, you know, respect people in the community, how to come to the rink every day to get better. That's, that is your number one priority, um, how to just be, you know, be great kids in the community. So, you know, those four areas right there were, you know, a lot of work went into it, but was so proud of that. And then, the, you know, the team moves and the franchise is finished. So that's that's the thing that probably hurt the most. Yeah. Dave, did you ever want to coach? Um, you know, it's funny listening to uh, it. Kind of reaffirms my my thoughts at the time. Uh, would I've liked to uh, coach for sure, but unless I got a five to ten year guaranteed deal. Um, Probably not, because when I got out of the game, I was still pretty young, and my family was young, and I didn't want to. Um, I didn't want to be bouncing around, and I had a little bit to do was why I retired with a couple of years left. But it's interesting to James. So to answer your question, but then I also thought that well, maybe you can move your yourself further up the up the ladder, up the pecking order, depending on where you are. And you start with the trainers, you start with the players, you start with the coach, the assistant coach, the coach. You know, if you can move up the line, you have less uh, people above you yeah. Yeah. give you the give you the axe, right? So, yeah. and and actually, too, Jeep, I I think the thing too is when you pour that first bit of emotion into that head coaching job, right? It's got to be tough 
you know, until you get callous to the realization that basically this is how it works, right? Yes, yeah. You know, the carousel, but boy, oh boy, when you build something and have it pulled out from underneath, that had to be something. You're developing young men too, right? They're yeah, not right. just the hockey part. Right. Yeah. Right. It is, um, and it's, you know, funny thing, you know, asking Dave if he wanted to be a coach and I, I did not think about it as a player as I was moving on. My last six years in Buffalo, I was a the older veteran playing with the younger players. I kind of came into that role and thought, but I, I even at that time I said, I don't know about being a head coach. Like you are the guy every day, you, you know, you be on. Yeah. it's your energy, your emotions, you're talking to the team, you making the decisions. I'm going, I don't know if I, can I do that? Do I want to do that? Um, and then, you know, after being an assistant coach for a number of years and then trying it, you know, once you, once you become a coach, you're all in. Like if you're, if you're not all in, it, it's not going to be, it's not going to be successful, but it, I mean, it, all in from, you know, the, the, what is the vibe like? What is the energy like? What is the, the atmosphere like in the dressing room? I mean, it, it starts, are, are players walking on eggshells? Are they comfortable? Are they, are they motivated? Are they pushing them? It all comes from the coach. Sure. And, and so just, I guess even now it's been, you know, six years as a head coach and getting your, you know, learning and getting better at it. It is, it is rewarding. It is fun. It is, um, I mean, I, I, I love doing it. Um, the, the, you know, I, I really enjoy the relationship with the players as much as anything, like pushing that, pushing them as hard as, because you have high expectations for them, but still being fair and still being respectful at the same time. It's, uh, and then seeing them have success and seeing them have fun. Yeah. That's well, awesome. What would you change? What would you do if you had a, a player like Laidlaw, who's just an absolute knucklehead in the locker room? Like, how do you handle that? <laughs> well, I want to hear this answer. I want to hear this answer. Yes. I, I mean, I, I would be, um, and you, I mean, do we have a Tom Laidlaw? Did I have one on my team? No, but I do have the guys who run the dressing room. And you have, those guys are your leadership group. And you have, you know, five to six guys who, it is so important that you're talking to them all the time. I mean, the communication is way different now compared to when Tom was playing. And I'll just, I'll just tell you this. My, my second year, um, you know, I had my leadership group and I had one young player and I still remember my first meeting with them. You know, they said, well, they wanted easier practices, less video, um, way shorter practices. And, you know, you know, they had all these and, and basically I went, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. We're not do that. This is the way it's going to be. Long story short, by the end of that year, we had gotten rid of, you know, all these, we had a group of older players who, who they were set in the culture where they thought they were running the show and they knew better, but the team didn't want anything and the team was, you know, floundering at the bottom. Um, and probably that the last leadership meeting, we had a young player, this Peyton Krebs, who's in Buffalo now, and he said, you know, the, the worst thing is, you know, when guys are at the back of the bus and all they do is complain about why are we doing this and why are we doing this? I mean, that's not helping anyone. And, and you should have seen the looks on the, the eyes of the other player, the other six guys in the room. Cool. The older players wanted to kill him. Yeah. Um, but so getting back, getting back to Tommy, I mean, constant communication and, and even talking why this is why we are doing this. We are doing this. And if you got an issue with this, like this is what we're going to do, but I'll explain to you and I'll have feedback with you about why we are doing this. You know, if I went back to Tommy was a good player. Like I, and I think Dave, you, you know, I thought Tommy was a rare guy who a 225 pound defenseman who could, who yeah. could defend, but had pretty good feet. Um, did, you know, didn't what didn't play offense, but he had good mobility for a big man who could defend as good as anyone in the league. That's, that's pretty good. You know, right. lovely type of guys. Right. How do we, how do we get better with that Tommy? Yeah. So it sounds like you're saying you just need to really dumb it down for someone like Tom, right? <laughs> Here's a question for both of you guys. So uh, yeah. I famously have told people that Herb Brooks said to me for our first game, the day before, says, Laidlaw, if you get the puck, give it to somebody else. You're not supposed to have it. 
So part of me thinks, okay, I kind of gave in, not like I was going to be some great offensive player, but my first year I had like six goals and 23 assists. I'm thinking, just maybe I could be a good two-way defenseman. Uh, but then I kind of took away, like, because Herb wanted me to play that certain role. Sometimes I look back and I say, did I cheat myself a little bit? Could I have been more? Or was I better because I played the whole role that Herb wanted and then got more opportunities? Because like his trade-off was, he would say, okay, if you do what I asked you to do, then I'm going to make sure you get on the ice those times. Right. Would you, would you, Dave, would you change something with your game where you maybe do more? Well, audience? It, listen, I, I, first of all, I do think that I, the, the whole thing does run through the head coach. It's no surprise listening to James talk that he had success because those are the things. There has to be a boss. There has to be somebody that's running the show. It's just a matter of the method to the madness, right? How you how you figure out to get the message to the people that need to hear the message to the strongest. And at the end of the day, you are the boss because there's a good chance if it doesn't work, you're going to be the first guy to go anyway. So I think for me personally, I had my best years for her. Um, yeah. My best years were... I was in my best condition I was ever in. Um, and uh, I loved the, the way he wanted to play, hold the puck, skate with the puck. And those were a couple of things. I think I had skills better off than dumping it in or out muscling somebody off the puck or things like that. So, no, I, I don't ever recall not you know being told specifically what my role was. Yeah. I just, uh, but I do, like in, in fairness to her, which I, I joked a little bit about him uh, at the onset, I did have my best years with him because he, a little bit like uh, what James was speaking about, but you, you, you empower, he empowered me to be the best player that I could ever be. And, and he almost forced me to be that. Yeah. I, that and, and that's exactly my best years of work. Yeah, and and yeah. I, a couple of things, Tommy, like I do think a lot of times the, the coach has higher expectations than the player does because right. You know, because he knows what he thinks you're capable of. Um, yep. And and so when, you know, I don't know how he sent the message to you, but, uh, you know, I d you know, don't have the puck as much. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I will say this. Guy who played in New Jersey who was a Hall of Famer, um, Scott Stevens, really good player. Re as, you know, physical and tough a defenseman that, you know, we saw for probably 20 years. I remember times where Scotty Stevens would overhandle the puck and that'd be the worst thing. I thought a turning point of his career was when uh, uh, Jersey brought in Rafalski and they put Rafalski with him. Mm. Yeah. And all of a sudden now Rafalski, fantastic puck mover, great skater. He had, he was the guy moving the puck. Scotty was the guy crushing guys in the corner. Get me wrong. Scott Stevens could skate, join as a fourth man. But when Rafalski started making the majority of the plays, Stevens went into becoming a, a Hall of Famer and a definite All Star. And he was a real good player, a great player as a young player in Washington. But the biggest knock on him was trying to do too much and overhandling the puck. Yeah, true. true. That you know, leads to a great question. Who were some of your guys' favorite partners that you played with and who helped elevate your games? Well, I, I look back at some of the old videos. Uh, Dave and I didn't get to play together that much. Dave was with Vad a lot. That was a question uh, for Dave and James. Yeah, well, uh, you asked the question in general. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, what about, I'll, I'll jump in and let the guys go. Uh, I, I watched some old videos. I love playing with James because it's the same kind of thing. He was, yeah, the, right. he was the Rafalski going up with the puck all the time. We, our roles were to totally defined. I knew that I had to get the puck to James as quickly as possible, and James carried the puck up the ice. Yeah. Yeah. I'm scared of that. I mean, that. Yeah. He was a mentor to me in um, a lot, you know, just, you know what they talk about now that the process of these kids coming to the league, it's not so much, it's certainly is playing, playing as a pro, but it's living as a pro. Yeah. How, um, how you manage your life, how you uh, do things. And that, um, that to me was, and you know, he was the left-hand shot player on the right side. Yeah. Which in those days wasn't unusual because most of us were left-hand shots. Somebody had to play. Brash was the same way. So I, I think it was that, and Vad's role for me was uh, certainly on the ice, but just yeah, just living life as a pro. Yeah, he was nasty on the ice too. People didn't well, see that all the time. Oh. Yeah, no, he was. He could, uh, and I, you know, I, I use my stick to protect myself also. Yeah, but uh, he was, uh, he was me. He was, uh, you know, if you can, in those days too, part of our job was keeping the front of the net clear. Yeah. Yeah. And make somebody who was coming. It's so different now. And I think in the game from skill sets, not even close. Yeah. Right? 
But in our, uh, I remember younger, that was the defensive song was protecting the goal and you keep the net clear. So you do whatever the hell you have to. Oh, it could get nasty in front of that too, right? Yeah. You do whatever you want to do. Yeah. What about you, James? Um, you, you know what? When I started my first, uh, the first end part of the season I played with Tommy, loved it. Um, into the next year, started playing with Tommy. And at some point, um, I know my my first full year, I didn't play as well. The team struggled and, I, you know, you, things got changed. I wish we could have played together for like three, four years. I think it would have been, and I mean that, I think it would have been awesome because I think it was a great fit. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and, you know, I know the, uh, the but you got, uh, you know, I know you had your injury with your spleen. That took you out for, you know, a fair bit of time. And yeah. Phil came in and mixed everything up and, and the revolving door started. Um, but I, you know, so if I then look back where my career went after that, I I probably played three years maybe with with Mark Hardy, you know. Oh. And, and um, you know, they they were, you know, amongst my best years. And I, I again, I just, uh, you know, he kept it pretty simple. He was yeah. an awesome communicator. Um super competitive who would and he really would stand up for himself yep um so i i mean i i liked playing with with harpo and um you know played with you know as my career went on played some different guys late in my career like i said i played with some young guys my and i will say this my my last year playing i played with brian campbell in in buffalo who then you know and i couldn't skate and i was you know 39 40 and he could skate like the wind and it was like you know i would I would say, okay, you get, I get the puck, you just get open. And I'll see if I can bring someone to me and I'm giving it to you. And, and then he would skate it out of the zone. And it was, it was fun. Well, that's interesting, right? How the rules were reversed from when you started. Right? Full circle. Yeah. Can, yeah. can we ask you guys, cause it comes up a lot on the show uh, and it's coming up on the 40th anniversary, believe it or not, of the Islander series that, when they were going for the driver five and that comes up all that's the right. time. That's right. Can you guys reflect on that a little bit? Cause I, as I, we say, I say all the time, as a 11 year old kid in New Jersey, I, I cried. I cried when Dave was on NBC with, I think, Sal Marciano crying in the locker room. I remember crying at home. It was like a, it was a heartbreaker for fans. I'm sure it was for you guys as well. It was a good team, man, too. Dave, jump in there. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's funny because that, I ended up in Buffalo the following season, right? And that's my, it, there was a lot going on. I, I often think of when James and Bob Brooke came in to that environment, there was so much going on in the room. Yeah. <laughs> Was that Dave? Was that when when James wanted his brother here? That's why they traded you. I think so. I think I, I talked to Craig actually at the alumni. Oh, that's the uncle, Craig Patrick, right? Yeah, Craig Patrick. Craig yeah. was your GM of trading. Yeah. yeah. So I, I I did go ahead. No. <laughs> <laughs> so people know I'm joking. That was not the reason. I don't want to. Oh no, yeah, it, it's funny because George Kalinsky has uh, books have been published of photographs over the time, and he's a great photographer with the garden. And they had, they had, there was a picture of me that was in that book uh, after that game. And uh, so the um, writer who was writing for the book and, and um, supported the pictures asked if he could talk about, talk about that time. So he asked me um, what my emotion was with, with the loss, basically, because that would have been the assumption. I said, really, there was just so much going on and I had really felt the writing was on the wall that I wasn't, I wasn't destined to be around the range of franchise for long. And, uh, so the emotion that you speak of had more to do with it. All, everything else was going up because that I got only got in the game five, um, because Barry Becker hurt. And we had, a, we had a pretty good lineup of guys who were out crash. There was, uh, Mike Rogers, there was myself right. and stuff like that. So all in all, and then, it, to this day, I'm like, why couldn't it have been Potvin or Mike Boss? Yeah. Or somebody. Yeah. And God bless him. He was a great player, great defender. But Kenny Morrill scores a goal. I know. Is that true? Yeah. You, know, Dan, you know what I remember about that, too? Because you didn't get into the last game. I remember how well you played in that game five. So that's the deciding game back then, right? It's the best of play. Yeah, I know. It was great. I remember, yeah. you know, that the um, at the time people were saying it was one of the best. Oh, and a couple of games of played of all time. Yeah. And that, that also too, during, for me in that, that, that time where the Islanders won, 
um, they always found a way. And if it wasn't, um, if it wasn't moral that got the big goal, it might have been Nystrom or it might have been. So you can say what you like about the great players that they had. There's no question that, you know, they, from Billy Smith to Potts and to Gillies to um, uh, Bossy to Trottier, they're all Hall of Famers. But I'll tell you, as you're well, uh, both of us, I think we're all aware of the fact over that length of time, there's always somebody that comes out of nowhere yeah. and man, has that game or scores the goal. For, that, for me, it was that Ken Moore on us. Oh, my God, not Ken Moore. <laughs> Please. <laughs> you guys may have been on the show. We had Clark Gillies on, and he, yeah, said, he yeah. said on the show, he said, listen, if we'd won that series, he thought we could have won the cup that year. I was like, you oh, know, thanks, thanks a lot, Clark. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, did you play, was he, he was gone from Buffalo by the time you got there, right, James? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. it's funny, he had a big impact because those guys loved him. He was there for a year in Buffalo, and yeah. Lindy and Mike Ramsey and uh, that whole crew, uh, you know, Mark just, awesome they saw the U.S. Yeah. Yeah, we had, yeah, in that ser- in that series, we were up two to one, right? And playing at the like, garden, and then uh, ran um, uh, was Brian, not one of the Sutters, uh, Dwayne Sutter. No, the other side. Dwayne or Brad is, is Dwayne or Brad were the two. Dwayne, Dwayne it's one of those scored like uh, three goals to tie or to win the game, a hat trick. You know what my my memory of that series obviously is the pain of losing it, the um, atmosphere between Long Island and the city. Um, how big, like it was, I, I felt like I was super naive and then like what an eye opener, like how big a deal it was. Yeah. Um, but in, in game four, like we were up in the series. Yes. I, I still remember um, it was either the tying goal or them to take the lead, but they dumped it in. They were four checking and I could have just rimmed it. I could have just put it around the glass and I tried to cut up, um, and um, got the puck knocked off my stick, and then it was a scramble, and the next thing you know, it ends up in our net. And that's, I was in your way then, too. Didn't I? I was I right beside you? I got. I, I don't know, but it was just so stupid. I mean, I, I still I still remember it. Um, wow. And uh, uh, just a stupid play that just keep it simple. So I remember that. Um, I do. Uh, what My feeling about the series, though, was that the Islanders, rightfully so, they're – you know, um, they'd won um, four in a row already, or was it that? Yeah. yeah, they'd already won four in a row. They're the best team in the league. Um, I thought that they wanted to f- physically dominate us, and we didn't uh, give in one bit. Like, I felt like that was the message we sent. Like, Brian Trotche used to try and run guys. Oh, yeah. Like, run guys from behind and be, you know, yeah. you know, and – uh I remember Mike Allison giving it right back to him. Like every oh, yeah. chance yeah. Mike was on the ice, Mike was cross checking, getting in his face. Like there wasn't there. We didn't give one inch to them. We respected them, but from, you know, Nystrom toughness, like no one gave an inch to him. And I felt, you know, everyone played physical, right? Yeah. Mark Pavlich never gave an inch to anyone. And our all play was good too, right? Every time they took a penalty, yeah. it was a good chance to score. Yeah. Like I think that was, that was really noticeable to me in that series was, yes, it, we respect these guys, how good they are. We're not giving them. Right. Hey, it's interesting you say that because my first year in the league, that 80, 81, Dave, remember we played them, well, you got hurt, right? In the LA yeah. series. We played them in uh, the semifinals uh, and we showed way too much respect. So just the opposite of what you're saying, James, we didn't do that, I guess. And it's funny because we hammered LA, we hammered St. Louis, but we respected the Islanders way too much. I remember thinking that it's like this not, we're not playing our game. We're not playing the same game we just played in the first two. They couldn't catch Rexy. Yeah. Um, but, like, I felt the lineup top to bottom. Like, I remember, you know, even yeah. Kent Eric Anderson. Yes. Big body. He didn't – those guys didn't give an inch. Yeah. Like, they they pushed back. We were physical. And, and whether that got out of the way out by game three, like, they knew we're not intimidating yeah. this team. We have to beat them. That's a good point. Well, I remember, too, one memory in game five when I was in the lineup. Um so Miko Mac um uh, Lennon. Miko, yeah. Miko Lennon. Lennon, who was a, a cool breeze of the hot summer day. <laughs> I tell you, he has he's a right handed shot, right? He has to puck right in the slot and he's got split dead to right. Yes. Yeah. And the puck polder guy it over his stick. That was overtime, right? That was overtime? Uh no, it was <laughs> no regulation. Oh, it's okay. Well, well it might have been overtime. Because yeah. Well, yeah, it was overtime. Yeah. Is that where our bench was, yeah. Now we're in uh end of the ice. Yeah, and it just 
It didn't bump Burkhardt real good chance, too, Rob. Yeah. yeah. But did you yeah. find you guys that, because if you look at the play where they scored, Tanelli clearly takes down, I forget who it was, or maybe it was Lennon. It. And then he was up Larry Patey. Yeah. Larry Patey. In the same play. <laughs> you, you know what? The, the whole game was like, the whole series was like that, too, right? It could almost be a penalty, like based on the way they call it oh, today. He was way too many. Oh. Look at that, that final clip. And you go, oh, my God, there were like at least yeah. five penalties. Tanelli's he's laying on top of him. Yeah. He's, he's not moving. Yeah. I know. And then he reaches out and trips uh, yeah. Haiti. But that was that. I geez, that that game five, man. I'll never forget being in that game. Uh, like, yeah, sometimes you always sound away. Yeah, I, I can't. You know, of course, I was I had the privilege of playing '79 when we actually beat them. That's right. And um, you know, but, but then on they just they always yeah. found. It's oh. a way to say it too, Davey. It's hard to kind of put your finger on it, but it's just like they found a way to win. They anyway says, "Well, what is that?" Right? Well, so I, you know, again, I saw the, the Montreal Canadiens at the end of their uh, four, and they played against the Islanders, and then played against the Oilers. Who yeah. that group had stayed together? They might have won ten, right? You know, but uh, they all had their. To me, they all had their distinct um, flavor, their distinct style. And, yeah, and to me, the Islanders simply. Found and they also amazingly had like 16 guys that won all four cups, which is incredible if you think about it. Well, the other thing, too, is they went 19 consecutive playoffs series that they won. 19 consecutive. To me, that that one will... That yeah, one. I think so. They'll never be broken. I guess, yeah. Never. But they, what do you think, too? Like, so so like, to Tom's point, where the 16 guys won all four cups, mm -hmm. where the Rangers are constantly changing yeah. our lineup, right? Like, even after you went to the finals of 79, you make the Barry Beck trade. Yeah. Three guys off the lineup, yeah. Three guys off the lineup, or two depth guys in, in the yeah. in, in the program. I mean, that's the, the way our history is littered with, uh, you know, they're that close. To, yeah. but, but in reality, not that close. Where you take a couple on the chin along the way. Now, I think it's a lot harder now. With there, you know, if you consider there's twenty to twenty five percent roster turnover every year, and depending on how you manage your cap, yeah. and uh, so it'll be, you know. Uh, teams now go back to back, uh, but I, I doubt there. Again, there are a lot of things in those uh, years that I don't think you'll ever have again. But you're right, sixty guys. Wow. Okay, remember that 80, Herb, 80, 80, 80, 81, We had the big tough team. You beat up St. Louis, beat up L.A., and then Herb comes in. So we have a good run. Typically, you're not changing the team like that if you go to the semifinals. But now Herb comes in. He wants a totally different team. So we went from being like beating the crap out of people to now we got the Smurfs. Uh, but. <laughs> But it's a pretty like good point though. Like some tough Smurfs though, right? I mean, guys that didn't back down at all. Well, that's the point, yeah, James. You know, you get the point at that time of the year. Uh, you know, it's either man up or go home, right? Yeah. And you know, it's just uh, it's just the way it works. And that's why you know most of the teams will eventually win it, and then they tell you or or lose in the finals. You find out how banged up everybody was. This guy's playing punches spleen, and the guy that flaps long in your like. Yeah. Yeah, it is true, right? I, but it's kind of like that badge of honor, right? To play hurt in the playoffs. Like, you, you almost want to be hurt. Like, if you're not hurt, then what are you doing? Yeah, right. <laughs> right. No, it's, uh, they were good battles, that's for sure. That's three of X Ranger greats, top 100 greats. Do you, what do you guys think about the team currently? Do you have any thoughts um, on what this year's going to look like? I think after what they went through last year, you know, such high expectations and the disappointment, I think that's going to motivate them. Um, and, you know, it happens so many times to, you know, teams that are on the rise, they're they're a good team and have a little setback. Um, I I just think that can, that can really help them go to the next level this year. I think when you have an elite goalie, yeah. you have – you have good defense, solid defense, and you have players who can score. The hardest thing in this game is do you have guys who can score? Goal goaltending and scoring. And they have both. I mean, they really do. Um I, I'm I, I mean, they it's, it's for me it starts with their goalie who I think talent wise is the best in the league. He maybe didn't play as well last year, but if you look at his body work over three years, uh, I I would take him over all, anyone, I think. What do you think of Lavalette as a coach? I think he's um I think he's smart. I think he's he's very experienced. I think he's very set on playing his system. He has his system with how he wants the team to play, especially you know, in the neutral zone. And I think uh, but I think um I mean when I I've read a lot of the stories and the 
the message that he's trying to get across and the things he's saying are, I think are spot on. Um, but you still, you have to have the talent. Like I, I think when he was in Washington, he had talent, but he had, didn't have tonal. He didn't have the top. I mean, I thought he had a bit of an aging group. Uh, and whereas you look at this team right now, they're in their prime. Well, here's the thing. After being around and you know, over at camp and being around and listening to him, there's a couple of things I think. Um, I think in watching now, so they lost on, a, on an effort, according to the uh, coach, against the Islanders exhibition a couple of nights ago, um, where the things that aren't systems, you can't systemize uh, going hard to forecheck. Now, you can read the play and support, I suppose, and things like that. But take the initiative to do those little things that aren't the system. So you go back to Dave's one and two of camp, and they had un- so many just one-on-one battle drills, just battle. And and, and the one I can't help think about uh, noticing at the time was Lafreniere against Kreider. So, yeah, they can... Uh, well, I was I was saying to myself, I've seen if, if I've got to go one on one on Kreider, I'm moving back in the line. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he's a big boy. Well, Lafreniere actually outsmarted and outskilled him oh. in one on one drill. It was, and he was so good. Kreider got so frustrated that he almost threw him through the boards. Oh, is that right? But the point is now, Lafreniere has to take that yeah. to the game. And I think the brain just, to me, and I, 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 it's hard to disagree. I think we all can conclude, there's no question, that Shesterkin's, if not the best, top two in the league. Yeah. I think we can all agree that uh, uh, Fox has a very subtle style, but he's an elite defender. Um, um, Keandre is on his way up. Uh, Truba is Truba. The blue line's pretty good. I think... Ultimately, the difference, do, do your top. It's funny when you mention Brian Trottier because he was the meanest guy. I, he was the meanest forward on that team. I'm yeah. telling you, he ran yeah. off well to get through it, and he was a Hall of Fame player. Do the Rangers have enough of that in their top forwards? Do you think they do? I don't. I don't. Now, now again, are they good enough to be a playoff team? Yes. Is Panera like you need a Panera to get to the playoffs? You need him to get to the playoffs. 90 to 95 points. As much as you need a goaltender in this game, you say you need guys scoring during the season to get you in. Does that game then transfer to the playoffs? And it hasn't to this point, right? Well, if you look stati- if you're looking purely statistics, no, it hasn't. And then I watch and then and so it's not a knock. This is not a knock player. It's it's just a particular style and, and does and I think the top teams, the top teams, top players have that. Right. Somewhere down the line, there's a top player that's an absolute prick. Right. And I, I'm just not sure the teams that win always have that. Absolutely. So you're talking like, like Brad Marchand and, and um the Kachucks, like somebody like in that ill, yeah. right? I'll even see this when Detroit was, you know, ten years ago when they were really good. Zetterberg, fuck that guy competed, yeah, and he was as hard, as heavy on the puck as anyone for a top player. And that's it. That's those two guys. Those two guys played heavy, hard games. And you, you throw in Shanny, like there, you can. I really, rarely now you look at back at the, you know, rarely the teams to me that are. Have been consistently successful postseason, uh, and they not have that dimension. Yeah, and Tampa, Tampa had a bunch of guys like that when they were winning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kucherov, oh, but Steve, but Dave, Dave, I also say this. Um, I also think, and I know Panarin is. I think he's awesome. He's so skilled, and you're not going to change him. No, right. But you still, you know, whether it's uh, Zavinajad and and um, Kako being a big beast now, can he be a big, a bigger bit of a heavier, heavier body? You know, Kreider can be a heavy body. Um, you need some of those guys got to take a bit of snarl on. Well, there's no question. No, and I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I include Kreider as being a top player. And yes. And Keandre, 
Keanu yeah. Reeves, Miller's a top player. Does he have? If he had, and he made I, I don't know that you develop that. Maybe there are guys that can develop it. But well, you, you, Dave, you said one time in a previous show, you said uh, they're all a bunch of guys you, you watch your daughter to get married to. Right. But that that doesn't really relate to when. Yeah. Well, you need one. One or two guys you want anywhere near you. Yeah, exactly. Well, <laughs> Malingren has it. Truba has it. Yeah, yep. that's true. Yeah. But I think like Dave said too, it isn't just, uh, I think Toronto has this problem too. You can't get a bunch of guys that are kind of, you know, aren't really competitive guys. And then you bring in two competitive guys. Well, that right. really doesn't change the nature of those other guys that maybe aren't as nasty as you'd like them to be. Right? You need it from someone in your top six. Yeah. Dave, so they, they brought in what, two or three guys that are older on short-term contracts, one-year deals, right? Is that correct? Yeah. Or yeah. And that's Blake Wheeler or, uh, and, uh, you know, Pitlick looks good. They're, they're, see, I think like a lot of teams, uh, you get to this kind of cap situation yeah. and now you've got to manage not only the cap now, but moving forward. And I do think that uh, Chris during his staff, given the economy uh, of their uh, program, uh, did a pretty good job of, of filling the, you know, filling the role. I, 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 but at the end of the day, to me, this Ranger team's uh, season will be predicated and determined by Keandre Miller, Cockle, uh, Lafreniere, Philip Heedle, and Braden Schneider. If those guys, five guys, can take that next step, they're all NHL, uh, and I'm not speaking for I think we all agree, they're all NHL players. Yep. And, and, and I remember thinking with all the picks that they had, that if you get one horse out of the deal and two or three other guys that can play, yeah. you're going to be pretty good. Yeah. You're be pretty good. You coached against Schneider Jr., right? Yeah, I did. I like you a lot. I really I like him. I'm telling you, I love him. Yeah. I just, uh, I, I mean, uh, I actually talked to him at the at, at the golf outing and um, oh. like it seems so, like such a nice kid off the ice, but I think he's got some bite. I think his yeah. his his ceiling is... Is very high. He's going to just keep getting better. Like I, I believe he can be a top four defenseman in this league. How it works with the Rangers lineup and their numbers, time will tell. But um, in in junior, he had some bite to his game, you know. And yeah, so um, I think he, honestly, uh, James too. I I I think he's got more upside offensively than people ever give him credit for. Get yeah, shot right. Yeah, yeah, good shot, shot, and he can move the puck. Um, you I know, think he can join. He can join as a fourth guy, and absolutely, he can do that with his speed. And I think, in, in, but your point is well taken. You know, which is it's a bit of a dilemma, uh, and it's been a historical dilemma for the franchise. Is a lot of guys move on because of the decisions that have been made or traded or whatever, and become winners, cup winners with other teams, and been that way there's been one cup in 80 some odd years and i just think that you know even now i think it's harder it's harder to keep people you when you yeah yeah when you're yeah, like schneider's a good example where he's going to be a good player his contract's going to be up and he's going to be demanding and should be getting a lot of money at some point uh yeah. and, and you get it done under the cap and where does he feel like dave to your point where does he fit in the lineup I mean, he's, he's a third right he's their third right d you know because of who they have who they have ahead you got fox and true behind them so yeah. I mean, those are, you would like to think that those are good problems to have because you're that deep. Yeah. But at some point, uh, somebody's going to want to get paid and, uh, right. and, and should get paid. That's so I, I do think, and honestly, if, if, if Keandre had a bit of a bite, yeah, he'd, he'd be Chris Pronger. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. That man that could ski. I didn't know something, Dave. I know you do this, but I didn't realize this past season was his fifth year playing defense. He hadn't played defense yeah. before. He, 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 look, you're off. Hey, um, Tommy, huh? I have to get running here. I okay, got uh, get going. Doctors of Flame. Great Thank seeing you, you guys. Dave, yeah, that's good. Tom, Tom, and Dave. Uh, let's do it again. But this was awesome. Yes, absolutely. Anytime. Okay. Have you fun in Dallas. See. You'll have a good year. Really. Thank you. Thanks, year. James. Okay. Yeah. Hey, see you, Dave. Hey, Dave. Can, can we ask you about Offman? Do you think he has a shot of making the team this year? Um. I, I say because I, I I it wouldn't hurt him to go to um, Hartford because he if training camp is was a true training camp and they weren't tied to salary caps like when you look on cap friendly you can basically determine the lineup right, right. by the money that's been spent 
and whether guys need waivers to go down and things like that. So he and Cooley and Brzezinski, Brzezinski, he, he has earned a spot. All three of them have earned a spot. Now, where? And, and with, with different things they've got going on. Yeah. Um, but I do think, I think every young guy should spend a little time in the minors. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I really do. And, um, you know, it, it makes you appreciate, uh, and, and you just learn to live. These guys now, especially as, and they've been, and this might be a criticism, they've been coddled along the way yeah. and coached along the way. But now they're out on their own in Hartford, riding a bus to wherever, and you get on and off. Now you get to kind of learn to live as a pro. Right. So, but to answer your question, given what he's showing in camp, does he deserve to start? Sure. Now, will he? That'll be the question. Dave, it's funny looking back at the old training camps, right? Remember the old, like when I first started, the old guys were fat and out of shape. Yeah, that was by design. They would just sit around, relax all summer long, and then we'd have like two-a-day practices. Training camp was a blast. The two-a-day practices, way more games. Now these guys show up day one, they're ready to play a game, aren't they? Yeah, they are ready to play. They really are. I, I'm, I, I do, in, in, in all honesty, the skill, the skill development is off the chart. Like you watch, <clears throat> you watch the, uh, you know, the kids that won't eat, there are kids that won't even have a sniff playing in the National League. Yeah. And they are so skilled. And, <laughs> and that's even, this will be my 19th year uh, with the franchise in the broadcasting area. You know, it's just, it's it's incredible where the skill is. Yeah, I watched the highlight reel of uh, Bedard from one of his games. Yeah. And it was great, but I was also thinking, well, okay, that's great, but there's a whole lot of guys that can do it now. <laughs> yeah, and and the thing too is, um, but it, we do have to kind of realize um, that the do the veterans do pick it up a notch once. Yeah, right, yeah, right? yeah. And the better teams, they pick it up a notch to come postseason. Yeah. You know, you watch the teams that have won, and it comes down February first. There's a little different. Tampa team, you know, over the traditional strong teams. And uh, and that's like every every time it started camp, I go, oh my God, this is going to be a great year. Look at these guys. They're flying out there. And then then they start to scrimmage against one another. And then they go out and play against the other teams. And well, the other team's got some people who can play too. <laughs> so it's it's a little humbling once it gets going. But yeah, you can't help but be excited. Why, so I, I'm going to tell you one of my first times I met Dave Maloney, okay? I'll tear it. So first training camp, so now I come in again. All the old guys are fat in that shape. I I had gone down and played in New Haven in the playoffs the year before, so I realized, man, I got to be in good shape. You know, so I worked out all summer, hit the weights, all jacked up. So I'm going around hitting everybody in training camp, and I hit Don, his Dave's brother, and D Dave has not, not on the ice; he's on the side boards, and he's yelling at me. He's, <laughs> and this is the first time Dave and I even talked to each other. They hadn't even met each other. Dave's a competitor. I mean, that's a real compliment. Dave can. Uh, he's going to feed you lunch. Oh yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, well, well I was. Uh, yeah, that was, but that was Fred. You know, like it, the big yeah. difference from, so I turned pro in 74. The difference between 74 and 84, 85 was I was in a lot better shape since 84, 85 than I was in 74. In second year pro, I, I weighed in at like 230. Did you really? But, yeah. Oh. It was just, I was like, did, did you guys, did you guys even skate in the, in the off season? Well, we did uh, by the time we got, but before the people, well, maybe Dave did too, but there's a lot of guys like Walt Kachuk and Steve Vickers and all those kind of guys. They just hang up the skates. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just tell the story. He put a nail in his skates at the end of the season and then pull the nail out. Yeah. Or yeah. yeah. It's true. But that was by design. It wasn't about them being lazy. It was more like rest the body up. Yeah. Culture. That yeah. Was the culture. Yeah. And the thing, the big difference now is um, in a lot of ways, the culture during, pre I won't speak to talk, Tommy played a little longer than I did. And, um, but the culture then was when you made it, you didn't have much else to do because you've made the NHL. Right. But now you watch all of them are, are working to be better, to yeah. get better. Oh, yeah, totally. You know, you talk like there's from Sidney Crosby, Connor McDavid, yeah. all the way down. And when those top guys set, that's why I think, you know, Crosby is probably the greatest leader in this generation. Yeah, yeah. totally true. He, just, he demands. He demands it of himself, and as a result, that that franchise has a high expectation yep. because what they're all expected. Yeah, in game too, right? He's a competitor. He's pulling his other teammates into it. He's looking at the, you know, you know, he's he's like what what they said earlier. He's a bit of a bastard. He wants the puck. Yeah, he'll run you over for it. You know, he's not a fighter. But yeah, you know, uh, Dave, you're off this too. When Mary Lemieux first started, uh, he was you know, a very talented player, but really wasn't that competitive, right? They could hold him right. against the boards. 
But later on in his career, that totally changed him. He was not. Well, yeah, and I think it changed when he he was privy to playing with uh, Messi and Gretzky, you know, yep. in that in that '86. Uh, yep. Yeah, and a good Challenge Cup thing at Hamilton. Yeah, about, yep. yeah Russians and uh, Soviets at the time, and and you know, he was an artiste coming out of the yep. Quebec League, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it just you know, as long as he cared, you know, as long as he wanted the puck, he kept it. He could do whatever he wanted, and. Uh, but no, the, yeah, I just think, um, you know, there's a lot of, and that's the other thing too, I, I can't help but observe is that the young kids now, like if you had the privilege, so you played with Gretzky right? yep. and then now it was late in his career, yep. but seeing somebody like that day in, day out, yeah. Yeah. You, you can't help but get better. Well, yeah, you, you know what you see in him is it's just that, like you said, Dave, it's that desire to be the best, that he can be the best player in the game. Larry Robinson, the same way, like both of those guys. And Larry was right at the end of his career. The one thing I, they're like little kids. Like they love the game still. Like it, they, they would act like little kids. But I mean, that is a total compliment. It's just that passion for the game. Uh, people talk about, you know, you do, do the motivational speaking, you talk about learning from your mistakes. I think, well, you know, when you look at those two guys, Gretzky and, and Robinson, for example, like Robinson, for example, as you've seen, Dave, he would come around the back of the net in our zone, fire right up the middle, trying to hit somebody for a, a breakaway. Well, very often it would get picked off and they'd go in and score. But what would Larry do? He'd go back and do the exact same play over. He'd just do it harder. Like he wasn't, I think they had that, and obviously, obviously their stature as players would allow them to do that. Yeah. yeah, but they just had that, that attitude, like, screw you, I'm going to go get it done. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think too, being privy to watching a player like that day in, day out. Yeah. Um, now I think kids with YouTube and different video, they can watch guys who try things now and you have the mission and you have the different things now. And I know a lot of those plays, now, where in our day you pay a severe price for two it's it's center, yeah. But it, but now it's a it's a play that's available to them. Like yeah. they, they, where they put the puck, you as a defender, you can't get it, yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And I mean, it's it's again. So you know, to to to, to be deemed a, a hot dog move. Yeah. Well, I just think a lot of times now that's that's the play that's available, and they have the confidence to do it. Yeah. Isn't that true? Yeah, like the mentality of us to play against those kind of guys, like we want to kill a guy, right? Well, they never they never would have done it because they know well, that we got to kill a guy. Well, the thing is, I remember playing against the Soviets in the uh, in the early 70s, and they were so skilled. Yeah. You, just, you, think you couldn't get the puck. You couldn't keep up with them. So what you did is you just chopped yeah. the little sure. pieces out of them because you couldn't do anything. Yeah. You know, so, and even that didn't work though, right? Because they were talking about things. Just they, yeah. they, they, it didn't bother them. I mean, it just so. And again, the, uh, uh, but that's the, uh, you know, that's just the way that times have changed. And except we talked about, I think playing with a badge of playing hurt was a badge of honor. Yeah. You know, it really was. It, but nowadays, they're 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 encouraging every every right to advocate for their long term health. Sure. Right? You know, and if if there's an issue. Uh, they're encouraged to to take advantage of whatever's out there to make themselves better. So it's uh, there's a lot of the things that you know. And I don't I, I don't look back. I look back quite proudly on the generation I played. Yeah, in. totally. Um, you know, but times change, and I think it's yeah. a more mature outlook on a lot of things. Isn't it true? We were the biggest liars in the world. Somebody asked you if you're okay. Oh yeah, I'm fine. You know, broken arm. You're, there it is. But look at the damage that's done to the guys in your generation. Well, this is true too. Right? A lot of mental health issues. But you know, I do think part of that is too. Like Dave does this as well. We, we keep ourselves in shape. You can fight off a lot of that stuff too. It's still there. Like I'm assuming all of us got CTE. I think we had, that's just a given for playing yeah. play the national. Yeah, yeah I, I just it's like I think we all. You know, a lot of us are on the. Like I said, it took ten years for me. No, I'm not. It took Herb Brooks to come along. And say, listen, you need to be in better shape. You need to have less, less body fat. You need to, uh, uh, and then, you know, the heaviest ever was in my life is after my first year pro. Mm-hmm. You know, the worst shape I was ever in. I'm in better shape now as a 67 year old than I was in the 19th. Yeah. And, and, uh, so I think in a lot of ways, we're all living in this next generation of player. Uh, you now, is, that's what they've done their whole career, their whole lives. Yes, take care of themselves. Well, Dave, I know I've told you this before, and I think it's, I think as I get older, I, th- I think I appreciate it more. You were one of the guys I really respected. Not did the game, obviously, yes, you know, being a captain of the Rangers, but even after the game and what you did to prepare yourself for after the game, too, you know, working on Wall Street. So that you mentioned earlier on the show, you were able to walk away from your career with two years left in your contract. 
because it just wasn't what you wanted to do anymore and you moved on to something else. So I have a ton of respect for you. I want to appreciate, uh, appreciate you very much coming on the show with us. Oh, it's a pleasure, Tom. It's always a uh, pleasure to chit chat. It was great. Uh, I did see James at the uh, alumni outing and he looks good. And uh, I had to tell him uh, before we went on, he's talking about doing hot yoga. And uh, actually, my wife is a yoga kind of person also. And I, oh. uh, we uh, went to a hot yoga uh, class in Tony, Tony, Greenwich, Connecticut. And I, was like, I broke out in a sweat in there like I was going to the electric chair. <laughs> <laughs> I had to get out of here. They already think some monkey fell out, out of the Still, Are you still uh, working at the liquor store downtown Greenwich? No, not so much uh, anymore. He's kind of the owner, Mike uh, Sabatino, is going to sell the plate. But not quite as much. That was fun, though. Was, was... How about the broadcast? You keep that going for as long? Just yeah, long? Well, well, sure. Why, well, you know, yeah. why not? I mean, I really enjoy it. It uh it allows me, um, you know, and I, I have to look around. There's 32 teams in the league, and there's yeah. one radio analyst and a couple of television guys, so there's not that many jobs. And I have right. one of them. And, yeah, I really do. I, I enjoy it. I enjoy 30, it 30, imagine we played when there was 21 teams. That was 32. Yeah. Oh. It's, uh, yeah, it's a bigger, it's certainly a bigger business. And, there, you know, you say, well, there are there are teams that aren't as good, right, on a relative basis. Right. There's teams for various reasons. But uh, I'll tell you, most of like last year, so we were out in Arizona and they have that little building now at Tempe. Yeah, that's right. And it's an into it's a great spot to watch. Oh, cool. Great, great spot. Yeah. Because uh, you're up, we were up our booth and you go, like, Arizona wasn't a very good team. But yeah. boy, from that angle, they, they got good players. Yeah. They got guys that are skilled. It's just, you know, so there's, uh, while there aren't, uh, Great teams in the league for different various reasons. Wow. But well, there is the short, like you're on this, Dave. There is the shortage of talent for 32 teams, right? There's more than enough talent. Yeah. Well, I, I think where you do get in, it's a little bit like starting pitching in baseball. Right. Uh, it's a goaltending position. Right. I think the depth in the goaltending position. If you go down, I remember Ben Juan uh, Alara and I during uh, Hank years. So even now, you get down the list of the goalies you can count on where you're getting. Ninety-five percent right. of who they are, ninety-eight percent of the time during the regular season. There's not many. There's not many in the league, uh, like like Hendrick was, and that's the thing now with uh, Shesterkin. Like he, it looks like he, he can he can certainly do it. He's got all these got competitive tools now. The thing is, he's got big uh, longevity skates to fill. Because Hank did it for yeah. fourteen years. Yeah, totally. Years. We got to do something about that hair, though, Dave. With Shesterkin. And the whole like the hair nest thing, or what did he? What does he use that thing? In the- yeah, he needs advice from a bald guy. That's what he definitely. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I I would like to have that problem with my hair after use some hair. Nah. No, it's easier this way. It's easier to have no hair. You open the windows, you're driving down the road, and you have to go and fix your hair like that. Well, I wasn't trying to get cold in the winter though. I, mean, I got a hat on. Well, you're out there marching around at four four o'clock in the morning. So. <laughs> I have this thing now where I'll drive down 95. It's like 40 degrees. I have to open the window. I don't know what it is. It's like I have to, I think it's getting out of the comfort zone and just proving that you, people are yeah, mental you. issues, maybe. Yeah. No, there's no. <laughs> Dave, if you, if Dave, if you look back, can you picture yourself being the ra- the voice of the Rangers for what you say, 32 years? And can you picture Tom waking up and doing Instagram videos? Do you, do you see that in the future for both? Well, of I just, I just, uh, Dave could jump in here, but uh, so my second year in the league, when first, first year in the league, Chris Katsopoulos and I rented Dave's and his wife's uh, apartment in Hearthsdale. Is it Hearthsdale? Uh, hey. His wife would stop by every once in a while to uh, check to see if the place was still standing. Correct. And uh, she walked into the room that I was in, uh, my bedroom, and I hadn't cashed any of my paychecks. They're all laying on the, on the floor. And she says, Tom, you know, you can put these in the bank. <laughs> it's just, I, I don't know how you were. I, I was just so excited to play the NHL at first. So Yeah. No, you were, no. I, I, and I've said, and, and we've talked about this, or and I've said about Tom, that he's, he's had one of the most – Interesting transformations uh, uh, through lights uh, from a guy that early on just wanted to drive a, a semi truck across America. <laughs> there you go. I mean, hauler and, and a guy. I like it too. And in, in listening to some of his uh, online stuff, we've uh, uh, he likes to wake up in the morning and apropos of the story you just told, uh, make sure the bed's made right and have that kind of military snap thing on the sheets and stuff. And I remember going into the uh, the condo that, that he and Chris were renting. I don't think either one of them had sheets. <laughs> <laughs> and we were just getting home at three thirty in the morning. Yeah, yeah. Well, even, yeah. Who knows where they were sleeping? Oh, 
let alone that. So yeah. now I, you know, he's morphed into um, a very inspirational character. But I, that, you know, and Tom and we we did a lot of this over COVID, right? Where we talked and we had a number of guys who played with Tom and over the course of his career, and and uh, he was a he was a, a leader. He was a leader in the room, uh, a little quieter than some of us, um, but. Uh, and those things have kind of morphed over side. So to, to would I ever have thought, um, no, I would have never thought <laughs> in the early days that we'd be sitting here in 2023 talking about, uh, I think both of our lives have moved along. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Is that true? Thank you very much, David, for having, uh, for coming on our show. Yes. So that, yeah, that was great. So we had uh, three of the top 100 Ranger, uh, best Rangers of all time. You were what, 98, 99? 87, 87 thank you. Are you sure? Yes, I've told I've got that engraved in my mind. Well, have they added Kreider and Zabat? Well, so see, that's going to be when they do the next book. I won't be on the list. Maybe it's the top 200 at that point. <laughs> the, yeah. Top 107, uh, maybe. Yes, I like that show a lot because we were going to go on and start talking a little bit about uh, uh, an upcoming the upcoming season. We, which we did a little which bit. We did, but we got into uh, just the three of us having a conversation. It was pretty cool. Well, yeah, it's very cool to see three old friends and yeah. teammates that I grew up as a fan watching just, you know, shoot the shit with each other. And it's great. That was a great, <laughs> great to see that. And like I said to Dave at the end, and James is in the same category, and I hope I'm in that category as well, where, listen, the, the love for the game, playing in the NHL is fantastic, but having another life after. Of course. You know, it's like James is coaching. And what I love about James, too, is uh, we had talked, I think when he first started coaching junior, about maybe being an NHL head coach. Yep. And he didn't know if he had the presence. It's interesting to hear him talking about it. Uh, how he coached so many years with Lindy Ruff, and Lindy had this presence to him. But as James has gone on, I think you see more of him talking. He has not. He definitely has. Oh, yeah. Presence. Yeah, he's the, he's the commander. He's in charge. He's yeah, he's going to wind up somewhere coaching and you know, yeah. eventually be behind the NHL, an NHL bench one day. Yeah, so many people. And again, we talked about on the show, but one of the good things for James was that uh, when he uh, didn't get taken to Washington when the team moved to, uh, so many jobs. It wasn't. He kind of downplayed a little bit. It wasn't just people calling him, offering him job. It's what they were saying to him about how good of a coach they thought he was, the best coach. Well, in the league. And on top of that, whoever has a bad thing to say about James Patrick, isn't know? that true? Yeah, it is true. He's, he's, he's a that, good dude. He is. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, yeah, we didn't get to tell all the stories, but me being a total smartass that I am, uh, I would pick on James or something. I do something. Makes sense. Yeah. Bully, right? And then he would get mad and he wouldn't talk to me for a week. And then he was eventually, right. he eventually come to me after the week and he'd feel bad. He'd apologize to me because he wasn't talking oh, wow. for a week. Wow. Such, so, such a good What an abusive relationship. <laughs> I, I apologize. And speaking of, so Dave was the leader of the Rangers. Yep. We can go back to the 84 series. And Tom, this is vivid in my memory. And I, and I watched it recently because that, that game, when you lost the Ironlanders in game five, was yeah. incredible. Oh, yeah. But afterwards, it, it was very different with the press. So like, NBC did like a, a six minute segment on the news yeah. about the game and what happened. And they went to Dave and they talked to Dave in the locker room. Yeah. And he, he was crying and he was, they, I think, I think it was Sal Marciano. He said, is this, you think you played your last game as a Ranger? And Dave's like, I don't want to think about it. And he cried. And then yeah. all of us watching, were also like feeling that emotion too. If they lost it. Yeah. And I'd forgotten how tough that was on Dave. Cause he is such a big part of the team. Oh, yeah. And Herb didn't, it was made him help you scratch the first four games. But the day we again talked on the show, when Dave got in, like and I, I watched the game recently. I love watching that game. Oh, it's great. And uh, he played fantastic, though. It's like he had total confidence, yep. you know, and he just had a great team. He wasn't bitter. Uh, all I remember him was just being a great team player. Yep. It was a huge game, and he was uh, playing a big role. Well, and, you know, he put Gresham in that game, too. He played great. He didn't put Mike Rogers in, as we talked about on the show with Mike. And yeah. You know what's I watched Mike play. I think I watched game one of that series, and Mike was playing. I thought it played a really big role, too. I think mean, he took him out. He had Larry Patey yeah. and Miko Lennon yeah. in there, so... But that was, you know, the thing, like, listen, those guys are all good friends of mine, so I'm not trying to, you know, go on Herb's side, but Herb's way was, uh, uh, he, again, he used the analogy, he was in his uh, father's funeral, yeah. he's in the church, and he's looking at the stained glass window, and all the different pieces fit together. Right. Didn't always have to be the best player uh, that was there. Well, that's what he famously said, and they quoted in the movies, not, not looking for the best players, looking for the right players. Yeah, totally. yeah. Maybe he felt that Patey and, you know, Lennon and were better over Rogers at that time. I, I, you know, who knows? But yeah, well, it was great. Yeah. It was great to hear you guys get together. I can see the love yeah. you guys have for each other. And it, it was it was yeah, really cool. Yeah, total respect for those two guys too. Like Dave, what he's done, James, what he's done. Just like listen to them talk to like real gentlemen, intelligent. Yeah. I mean, like that's all day thirty two years, but with the Rangers after in his second Ranger career, which is crazy. And you mentioned about how you're proud of what they've done afterwards. That's the premise of the show. Yeah, it's very your true. Career and then it's the yeah. change afterwards. So yeah. Yeah. those guys are examples. Of it. That was a great show. Great you show. do that again. Let's go Rangers. Hi, right, Daddy. All right, grasshoppers. 
Thank you for listening. We had a fantastic show. We'll see you next time.